Hello, Chameleon Academy. Today, we're going to be talking about fogging. Fogging has been a relatively new hydration technique in the, in the at least in the mainstream chameleon world. It's actually been used by uh, advanced breeders for quite a long time now, so it's not an unproven technique, but it is new to the mainstream chameleon community, and so there's obviously going to be a lot of questions, and there's going to be a, a period where we have to get used to uh, how to use it, how to implement it, and how to do it correctly. Every technique we use has to be done correctly. And in the spirit of this goal to be as educated as possible so we can make the best decisions, I am going to have a two-part series on fogging where I interview Peter Nechas. Peter is the most outspoken advocate for fogging as a hydration technique, and so it's appropriate that I bring him on and we have this conversation. This interview is going to be released in two parts. The first part is going to be fog, mist, hydration in the natural condition. What are they doing in the wild? Why is it that observing the wild condition came up with this idea of fogging during the night? Once we understand that foundation, then we can go into actually implementing it in captivity. And so please join me for the first half of the interview where we talk about fogging and its relationship to wild hydration. Please join me in welcoming Peter Nechas to the Chameleon Academy podcast. Hello, Peter. Hi, Bill. I send you <laughs> many greetings from you? the late afternoon in Europe, uh, making it to early morning in the U.S., I guess, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, uh, and where exactly are you? I'm now in the Czech Republic. It's just in the middle of Europe. Central Europe, actually, okay. if you watch the map which is behind me, it is somewhere uh, like uh, that, that area. But forget <laughs> it, forget it. Central <laughs> right Europe. There. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. We have, we have been doing this chameleon thing for many, many, many years. And we just keep making it harder for ourselves. And so uh, I... I I just did a, an episode uh, sharing why I thought it was uh, valuable for us to continue pushing our herpetoculture forward. And I'd just like to hear from you in your words, why do you keep doing this, keep making things complicated for yourself in taking care of chameleons? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, step by step, I'm getting a little bit older uh, and older. <laughs> Surprisingly, each year I get one year older, and I get close to a, a philosopher uh, who has lived about 2,000 years ago in, in Greece, uh, Socrates, you know, and then he, he had a had an idea, uh, because he was really like a polyhistoric, he, he knew everything. He was actually of the of the uh, era where the whole wealth of knowledge of humanity was, uh, was like so dense that one person more or less could comprehend it in, in, in one, one, one life, which is, which is no longer, of course, possible. And this nope. guy was very wise to say, you know, the, 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 the more I know, the, the, the less I know, you know, which does not mean that we get stupid. We really gain much more and much more uh, knowledge. But if you really, uh, like, get answered your previous questions and you do it proper way, <laughs> then new questions arise. You know, the more you know, the more you know what you do not know yet. So... Uh, mm -hmm. If uh, mm -hmm. if this uh, would be uh, something that, that would cause frustration, we would skip. But as we both are triggered by you know the unknown, the the future, the the um, uh, the, the, the 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 sexy uh, area of of you know uh, unleashing the the myths, unleashing the the unknown, you know, then it is actually an engine that that, that really. Uh, makes us to to go for uh, studies, go for experiments, uh, hit the road for uh, I don't know twenty four or thirty six hours for you recently. You know, just to come from America to Madagascar just to yep, feed yep. your curiosity and, and 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 see how things are. And I guess you, you you will confirm that you know you have got 
lots of answers to many of your of your uh, uh, questions before, and I'm, I'm sure you came back with with much more questions. Well, I had answers to answers. questions I didn't realize I had. Uh, yeah, 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 and then, then you get out of this like uh, Downing Kruger syndrome. You know, I don't know what I don't <laughs> know because now I know yeah. what I know don't don't know, and this is perfect. Yeah, so there we go, step by step, and and the good thing is that we can uh, like meaningfully share our uh, knowledge and and, uh, uh, combine all the approaches and get to an idea how to make things better. And this is, this is, I think, a noble driver. Okay. So why is it important for us to study the natural condition of chameleons in the the wild? Well, you know, uh, uh, it does not uh, make a difference whether you believe in God or not. But the way how the uh, environment in which these fantastic animals are uh, thriving and developing and uh, um, going step by step through the evolution is the mother nature, you know, and. Uh, while uh, you, you cannot uh, like take any entity out of the context in which it is living, so it is logical that if we have questions on how the animals thrive, what is their physiology, how this and this uh, feature uh, phenomenon was shaped, the, the original uh, source of information is back there in the jungles, in, in the, in the uh, deserts, and in, in the hills, and in the lowlands of uh, Beat Africa, Madagascar, and other territories inhabited by these fantastic uh, creatures, because this is where they live, this is where they interact with the different uh, parts of the environment, and this is the only place where we can get the idea uh, uh, what has actually shaped uh, all these fantastic mm-hmm. features. We cannot do it a different way, and even, you know, that there are some people saying, you know, uh, but it does not matter. Uh, and, and we ask them why it does not matter. They say, you know, uh, but we keep them in captivity. I say, so what? And they say, you know, captivity is completely different. And I say, well, it is different if you make it as such. Yeah. And if you don't want to make it different and you want an animal to thrive. So uh, I do not see any other logical and actually ethical approach which is which is found even based in in uh, uh, legislature in in some countries you know then to provide them what they naturally need even not doing it is actually like denying uh, uh, logic it's denying ethics and it is actually even uh, in some countries against the law which i, I feel is, is, is proper <laughs> Yeah, well, so this has been a a constant topic here on the podcast and a constant discussion topic whenever you're here as we talk about the natural condition. Because exactly. Because there's, I mean, honestly, there's few people in the chameleon community who are is as traveled as you are to all these different uh, environments where chameleons come from. And so you have a somewhat unique, uh, very small pool of people that we can go to to say, what are the common threads between all these different environments that the chameleons are in? And uh, we, we could talk forever about the lights and, uh, and, and all the nutrition and all these different aspects, but so we can actually get an episode out instead of having a 24-hour live feed, uh, let's, let's uh, reduce that to hydration. And uh, we there's we've been talking about fogging as a specific aspect yeah. of that and so uh let's talk about what is the natural condition why is it that fogging is now an important i mean it was always important but it's become uh more in the uh the focus of chameleon hepatic culture why is that what, yeah. what is the connection to the natural world yeah you know, it is. Uh, uh, let let me tell you a short story, actually. <clears throat> and the story is, as you as you say, uh, I am really like um, obsessed with uh, the knowledge about the chameleons in general, and of course the chameleons in the natural environment in particular. So I invest lots of time and and, and uh, um, amazing amount of money. 
to really making make it happen to be there and to do crazy things you know like to walk days and nights through desert uh, climb hills because uh, regardless i'm overweight you know and uh, uh, even like uh, waiting for the uh, first uh, morning drops of dew just sleeping in a sleeping bag below the just below a chameleon which is sitting up there uh, in the canopy above my head so all this i'm i'm doing like with it love and passion for decades and uh, uh, i uh, from time to time have to say that i come to a very strange observation and uh, the first of the observation was actually of myself yeah and i said you know what what really is is uh, quite unbelievable, or it was quite unbelievable when I came to this point. I say, hey Peter, uh, just having a dialogue with me myself <laughs> up there in, in the desert, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's so just you, you, the sleeping bag, and yeah, the chameleon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You feel lonely, so <laughs> <laughs> you uh, you make a schizoid situation out of yourself, and and you talk to yourself, and I say, hey Peter, you know, actually, uh, like you have seen chameleons for decades in the wild and doing lots of things you can actually uh, observe all the uh, aspects of their biology you know i've seen i've seen uh, them sitting and doing nothing i have seen uh, them um, uh, being at the same spot for a couple of years i have seen them uh, to uh, to climb up to go down to cross the the road uh, to uh, to swim uh, I have seen them. Uh, I have seen them uh, pooping, and I have seen them uh, basking. I have seen them uh, reproducing. I have seen them uh, like fighting against each other. I have seen them eating each other, and so on. I, I saw almost everything. You know, one thing I have never seen. I have never seen them in the wild drinking liquid water. And I found out that actually, at th- this is this is true. I have never seen it. While in the captivity, we we see it often. We can see it daily. You know, we can see it on a daily basis. Uh, even uh, people that are quite experienced with chameleons, they would swear. You know, that s- specifically some species, yeah, are heavy drinkers that really like drink a lot. And every morning, if they spray them, and if they miss them, and if they give them liquid water, they take water in. And I said, my goodness. But what what's 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 in in this observation strange? How it comes that you have never Peter seen it? And then I said, hey, okay, so let us try to uh, look at it from the scientific point of view. So there are two options only. Okay, uh, either you bias your observation by being the, being there, and they would not do it because you are mm-hmm. there and because you influence their behavior and they are shy or they simply say, hey, you want me to, uh, to, to drink, right? I will not do yeah, because you know, <laughs> masses of these guys and they are quite tricky sometimes. Uh, or what I have observed is somehow a piece of what we can say truth. Okay. And I say, okay, so... Uh, what would it rather be, a bias or truth? And I said, okay, uh, let's let's try to explore bias. So, if I would bias chameleons so heavily, I would very likely not be able to observe all the other things. But I have seen them. I've seen uh, females laying eggs. You know, I've seen them really like um, uh, fighting against each other and 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 uh, um, saying to each other, "Hey, sorry, uh, you are the other bigger mm-hmm. one, so let me go." And they let them go. I have seen almost everything, just not drinking liquid water. So then it comes to the other. So it might be the truth. And I said, "Hey, okay, so uh, calm down, Peter." Because obviously it is a vertebrate and hydration is, of course, obviously a substantial part of, of their lifestyle, of their, of their life cycle, of course. And we can see it in the captivity. So in what an extent is captivity actually different to nature? Yeah. And then if, if, if we are really f- frank and, and come now back before we w- would build, uh, actually, uh, we, we, we did this, this big step uh, in, in uh, like propagating and, and uh, uh, trying to bring the fogging idea to, to the white public together, if we go like seven, eight years uh, backwards, 
then uh, what was actually the typical difference between the environment out there and in the room is that we expose the chameleons to the environment which is typical for us. It means to a room where we sleep. And usually, with some exceptions, of course, if you live in southern Florida and in summer it is quite humid and so on, so it does not fit. Yeah, But in general, you know, we actually live in an environment which is pretty dry. And because we wanted the chameleons to be hydrated, so we gave them water at the daytime and we did not consider them to be alive enough to drink <laughs> at night. So we, we like, you know, said, okay, you are, you are almost dead at night, so we, I don't bother you. But you anyway do not drink. Yeah? And they do not drink at night. Uh, well, <laughs> they don't, but they actually do. The, quest, the, 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 the reason why most of the people do not know is because they are not as crazy as we too. Because if you, if you go for a uh, search for chameleons in the wild, uh, of course, to be very efficient, we do it at daytime, but mostly we do it at nighttime. And most of the people do not go and do not get the idea to go to the jungle, you know, at night. It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Come on, you know. Uh, you do not know where to st where you step. Yeah, and Madagascar is is simple because there is nothing uh, really so dangerous. Uh, maybe the the pass is the most dangerous stuff, and the most dangerous animal is fossa, which is so scared that she's uh, running away uh, as as far as she can. And 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 then humans, okay. But you know, if you go in India, you <laughs> might uh, you know get a, a tiger. You know, I have seen several times. I have seen leopards at at the, the, the middle of the night, you know. So yes, it's uh, or, or in Africa, you can you can meet elephants, you can meet buffaloes, you can meet w w whatever you say, you name it. So it's dangerous, and, and this is why people do not have usually the exposure to what happens at night. And uh, just uh, recalling one of our um, uh, discussions, when I uh, remembered uh, some of my nights in Yemen, where I have spent many months of my life, you know, that it was a trouble. I could not spend whole night searching for chameleons in Yemen. You know why? Because I could not see anything after 1 a.m. The fog was so dense that it was sometimes uh, tricky to just to, to find the path back to your car, you know, and then we didn't, did not want to get, get lost in the middle of, you know, an Arabian country, you know, in the middle of uh, nowhere, in the middle of uh, something that it can, might, might uh, be dangerous. So, uh, you normally do not see it, and and I I understand that people say, hey, what, 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 fog, what 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 is it? They have never seen it, yeah. But I've experienced it on my uh, own body, and and uh, I've breathed it in, even in environments which are in general considered extremely dry. The trick is that actually, you know. Uh, it is it is a matter of actually uh, something which we can call climatology, but it is actually just simple physics. You know, if you look at some environment which is not uh, being added water, so consider a valley. You know, uh, an isolated piece of environment. You know, there is a constant uh, content of water there. In that environment, there is, I don't know, one billions of liters of water, be it in the soil, be it in the plants, be it in the animals, you know, be it in the air. And for us, the water content in the air is interesting because it is actually constant. The relative humidity, uh, and this is a lesson from physics, uh, is then strictly dependent from various factors, which is mainly driven by the air pressure, we can ignore it, more or less. And the most important factor is temperature. So, in Yemen, if the temperature raises uh, around uh, 85 to 90 degrees at daytime, the same content of water in the air makes it to have a relative humidity about 30 to maximum 40%. But the same air, if, if it gets cooled down to this 16 to 18 degrees centigrade, it means like uh, uh, 58, 62 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, raises 
the uh, relative humidity to the level of almost 100% or 100%, which is actually the dew point, so that the water content in the in the air is too much, and the uh, the air starts actually expelling the uh, excessive water via condensation on cold environment uh, parts like leaves, uh, producing. Uh, producing, of course, uh, dew, and the uh, the start of dew is actually the, the condensed uh, little little particles of something that makes the air milky, and we call it mist or fog. You know, there are lots of, of course, um, uh, phases of uh, whether we, we we call it mist or fog. But the main imp- and most important thing, which we will come back uh, to in our discussion, is that it is excessive water. Uh, con- uh, which is actually a part of the air in so small particles that it does not fall down because it's still light and it builds this uh, substance which we call actually mist or fog. Yeah, And this is actually where the, the idea came. At the night time when, when we sleep, we do not have fog at our homes. We have sometimes uh, hardly 30 or 35 percent of relative humidity, which means that we offered the chameleons, we offered eight years ago, to the chameleons the same environment at night time, what they face in the daytime. And we made it the reverse at the daytime when we said, okay, and now the sun is up and now the lights are on, you know, and now the chameleon is thirsty. And it was thirsty, of course, because uh, the, the, the night was dry. So we gave them water and they drink and drink and drink and say, hey, we, 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 we are thirsty. Why are they drinking? Well, <laughs> because they, they have not uh, get their portion of water uh, in, in, at the night time so they need to compensate and they compensate the way which we offer and we offer what we offer of course uh, liquid water so they drink and now just uh, not to prolong the, the, the idea just let us stick with this uh, uh, physics you know at the same uh, uh, if, if you would like uh, then to uh, answer for instance the question why is that that uh, people report on uh, on respiratory disease uh, while the chameleons are kept too moist at the daytime. The question is is proper and the answer is very simple. It is the same. You know, the same amount of water which which makes it at at, uh, 58 degrees, 100% relative humidity and makes it at 90 degrees, 30% of humidity, you know, if you add water at 90 degrees, to be 100, it means it is full of vapor because this is uh, then out of the range of the dew point. It can happen uh, just below 70 degrees, you know, otherwise it, it does not happen, you know. Then you create vapor and the vapor has double or triple uh, amount of water dissolves in the in the air so that you get the effect like you know if you if you go to a washroom and and uh, b- you know pour uh, hot water on yourself you know that you that you almost cannot breathe you know why because you inhale so much water that the lungs get flooded yeah, by, by water, the alveoli in, in, in the lungs get really verbally flooded with the water. The water has nothing to do there in such a big amount. And what it happen, what happens is that the cells grow. They suck in the, the, the excessive water. And uh, uh, despite of the many people that believe that the cell is actually a, a very plastic um, uh, feature, it is not. It simply sucks water to a certain point and then it ruptures, you know, and when it breaks down, it gets killed. And then imagine uh, that several thousands of uh, cells of the lung alveoli getting damaged. It means all their content is now decaying in the lungs, which are exposed to the airborne diseases and airborne germs, be it uh, the gram-negative bacteria, uh, pseudomonas, aeromonas, and then others, you know, they get there and they get a very, like, sticky and very rich juice of dead cells there on which they can then reproduce and produce their toxins and then the 
link to respiratory disease is is uh, very clear. Yeah. So this is how to understand actually uh, the the uh, what, what happens. Uh, sorry that I was so long with my story, but but th this was this was actually my finding. You know that uh, we re revert we revert the uh, humidity cycle uh, in captivity. Uh, if compared to the natural one in the in the wild, and this is of course something unnatural, and this is something that you specifically pointed with, with in your podcast uh, uh, too, that this is one of the little but very important uh, details that make the chameleon either comfortable or not comfortable. And uh, a respiratory disease is not a little discomfort; it is a heavy disease, which is in many cases actually uh, unhealable and deadly you know so uh, this is this okay, is so how now it we're works. talking about the humidity or the water in the air we'll say that the water in the air is hydrating yeah. the chameleon but that is a little bit of a difficult concept because we're used to yeah. drinking going yeah. into our stomach being the method of hydration what is this breathing in the water in the air. How, how, yeah. how can we can explain Look, that? <laughs> you, yeah, you just repeat my my own concerns when I came up with this idea. You know, because then the logical conclusion is exactly what you what you now formulated yourself. You know, it means actually that the chameleons seem to get hydrated by the nighttime high humidity slash fog. Is it possible? And then I made some research in my, my school times and I remembered that actually it is possible because the uh, lungs of vertebrates are capable of a uh, special mechanism. They are capable of taking in little particles of water uh, and they can resorb them. They are not capable of, uh, of uh, uh, like... Uh, uh, getting resorbed uh, big amounts of liquid water. So if it's a drop, it is too much. But if it is fine particles, like the fog, the vertebrate lungs are capable of it for decades. It is actually a mechanism which is very successfully used by human medicine and um, and uh, veterinary medicine uh, f uh, for uh, healing some lung diseases and transmitting some um, some specific uh, um, like healing uh, substances like antibiotics through the lungs to the to the uh, to, to, to the to the body. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so it is possible, and it is actually like a phenomenon which is quite well known. It was just not known that the chameleons, and by the way, not only chameleons, but also other animals which are exposed to similar uh, uh, environments, uh, can uh, get a certain or even a major amount of water that they need through this phenomenon and now you know uh i was also i, I was really like um fascinated by the idea i said I, I need to get the proof you know because bill uh, yeah. will ask me <laughs> yep, bill will <laughs> yeah for proofs good idea yeah but but peter give me give me a proof so what I did is <clears throat> I went to one of my beloved countries and frankly uh, the the best uh, best country I would like to do it would be um, uh, here on the map uh, just here mm. in Yemen okay and I was not able to do it because Yemen is uh, uh, unfortunately for more than a decade uh, victim of uh, a local civil war and it is impossible to get to that territory so for 10 years I travel all around you know I've been to Oman several times to all the uh, United Arab Emirates I have made it even to Saudi Arabia recently which might be may be interesting uh, for you. I, I have not yet published okay. all the fan fantastic uh, uh, pictures and uh, observations that I made there, but I could not do it in, in, uh, in Yemen. So I decided to do my field observations in Oman. So what I did, I said, okay, so if, if it happens, then uh, uh, we need to measure. 
So what I did is I found a very nice place uh, in southern Oman uh, in the vicinity of the city of Salalah and I was able to spot about 10 specimens of the Arabian chameleon which is very close relative of the uh, wild or Yemen chameleon in the environment in the late afternoon. And as you know, chameleons do not move so much, so uh, I waited until it gets dark and I get to get to these places again. And what I did is, I drove with the car to these places, I took the chameleon, I waited it, and I put it back on the, on the uh, exact branch, back there, okay? And then I went uh, to have a sleep. And just before sunrise, I made the same. I drove to the same chameleons, found them sitting, of course, at the same branches there, took them down, measured their weight. Uh, I will, will not now uh, go into detail of this methodology. Yes, I wiped them off. Yes, I, I, I looked at the environment. Yes, I measured some, some issues. But the major finding, which was actually what I uh, was expecting but not in that, uh, that that amount was that the chameleons in the morning were heavier than in the evening and now uh, ask yourself the question yeah uh, how it comes so we said uh, have they eaten something <laughs> believe me not they sleep mm -hmm. whole night with closed eyes they don't eat so they cannot gain anything you know uh, do they poop to, to, to somehow? They usually do not poop at night. Uh, we know it from the captivity, you know. So this is, uh, but then we would get yeah. a loss, yeah. but we get a gain, you know. So I said, okay, what can it be? And the only, uh, the only, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, answer was they have inhaled fog whole night, okay. And based on that, a chameleon with the average uh, weight of about 50 gram was heavier by about 0.2 to 0.5 grams, which equals, in human terms, that they would drink something between one and two liters of water. And by the way, and that's not a surprise said, to me, well, because okay. after talking to you, I went ahead and did that experiment with the chameleon in my cage, and I could... I could measure the in and, my collection. And it works. Yeah. And it works. Exactly. And I said, okay, so yeah, there's now, no magic know, here. <laughs> it's no magic, of course. Yeah, it's it's there. It's simply there. And as you have done it, to verify this, when I came back home, I had uh, I had uh, um, a couple of uh, specimens of uh, uh, three species of chameleons uh, set through uh, through uh, an experiment like that, and I I did I simulated actually the two things which were the question of myself uh, in what an extent the humidity as such influences this and in what extent does actually fog influence it so i made several uh, several experiments myself uh, using dry air at at the at the night like years ago you know and no surprise uh, the chemists did not gain anything. They lost the weight at night time. And this is actually then the very simple um, like explanation why the chameleons are so heavy drinkers, specifically in the morning, because from the mother nature, they are used to gain weight, you know, and they did not gain the weight. So there is a deficit, you know, and mm -hmm. and. If, if there is a deficit of what they would expect in their, you know, cells that have this millions of years memory, they did not get water, but they even lost it. So they are heavy drinkers because they have to compensate what they did not get and they have to compensate what they lost. This is why they drink. Uh, this is why, for instance, the Mellers chameleon, you know, the, the Triocerus melleri, a huge one, the biggest continental African chameleon, is believed to be a heavy drinker. Expose it, please, to heavy fog at night at 16 degrees and it will not drink. Yeah. I have made these experiments before, and I, I knew that. Yeah. Now, uh, this was this was one thing to to, to, to say to see what what happens with, with the humidity. And what I found out is actually, if you expose the chameleon to low levels of humidity, it means like forty uh, percent of uh, relative humidity and less, they lose weight. And if you uh, have humidity levels, say about uh, eighty percent and more, so. They sit in humid air, but with no fog, 
they stay same. They stay same. Okay, so they can okay. keep, they manage the humidity just by breathing in humid air without fog, but they do not gain. Once you add fog, yeah, and it happens, of course, only at highest levels of humidity, yeah, then you, then you see the gain. And uh, then you can experiment with that uh, in, in the environment. The longer and the more intense the fog is, the more the gain is on average. Yeah, it it can have some variations, of course. Yeah, but on average, the denser and the longer the fog exposure is, the more uh, hydration happens. Actually, yeah, the uh, humid air keeps them balanced, but do not do not go up, do not go down. And dry air actually desiccates. And because I knew that you want to do it yourself, uh, I asked also. Uh, uh, several tens of our colleagues, and this is fantastic that we have this community, yeah, of people that are curious, same as us, you know, and you can sometimes, you know, gain their knowledge, lick their brains, and uh, uh, motivate them to take part in some research. So I, I made a I made a, a, a little project and I said, hey guys, if you want to help me, this is how it works. Yeah, You need, of course, uh, scales and the scales must measure something uh, with, the, with the preciseness below one gram, you know. Mm -hmm. And then if you are capable of, you know, measuring this and this and this, do please me a favor, do the experiments together with me. And they did and they confirmed, as you do, that this is what actually happens and and how it works so uh, from the uh, from the nature up there in in, in yemen and in, in in oman you know to the laboratory to to our to our uh, breeding uh, breeding um, uh, environment and then uh, like terrariums and cages and we see that we see it works yeah and then of course i also ask them what they observe next to these numbers yeah numbers are important and then we know it and then, then we have now the proof okay and we can of course fine tune it uh, and and i do of course and i tell you another story a little bit later uh but uh then uh, what what does it mean then for for the recommendation um, in in the, in the captivity for what 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 conclusion do we do we make up out of it yeah well, the conclusion is obvious, you know. This is, again, one of the little but extremely important pieces of, uh, like, wellness that we can provide to our chameleons to feel closer to back uh, in, in, in the wild, mm -hmm. in our cages, and make sure that they live longer and live more, more, more uh, happy uh, life than, uh, than, than before before we get to that uh, level of knowledge and understanding what actually happens. yeah. Uh, Peter, you made a distinction between humidity and fog. What is that difference? Okay, look, <clears throat> as we said, the, uh, 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 the air is actually the, the primary substance in which uh, uh, the, the water can be dissolved. Okay, and it dissolves in the first way in the form of vapor. Okay, so Im uh, imagine that vapor is actually solitary, yeah, individual molecules of water that get dispersed in the in certain volume of water. Yeah, it happens through boiling, of course. You know it uh, from uh, from uh, from our homes. It happens from water bodies. It happens from the rain and so on. Whenever water evaporates, the vapor, it means solitary molecules of water, get uh, almost equally dissolved in certain amount of water. Now fog is a little bit different. I said it is, it is actually um, uh, the form of uh, water dissolved in air, which is not um, composed by single molecules, but by aggregated molecules to build small, tiny, roundish particles. 
Okay, so uh, imagine that they are like little drops. They are so tiny that, as you know, are like fog looks like that they f they they fly in the air. They do not go down. Uh, the, the fog falls sort of. Yeah, if, if the, the bigger the, the particles are, the the quicker it actually falls to the to the to the ground. But uh, there cannot be uh, dry air with fog because humidity <laughs> yeah drives the the uh, content of water and if you drop the temperature as we said uh, the uh, the uh, relative humidity raises and if it raises actually at the dew point above 100 percent which is impossible because you cannot have more saturated uh, mm -hmm. environment than 100 percent so this extra percentage which you cannot measure is actually uh, built by the expelled Particles of liquid water which are pushed out of the air. Okay, once you warm it up back, the fog dissolves and gets back. Uh, it dissolves in in the in, in the air, and you can you can we have as I said a wall of a valley, for instance, yeah, be it Yemen, be it in Africa, be it in Madagascar, yeah, can be filled with fog, you know. And once the first sunshine comes, it just raises the temperature by one or two degrees. The fog starts to dissolve because the temperature uh, of the air raises, and the air is capable of taking in more moisture than before. So the the, the fog is not uh, not anymore uh, there and very quickly also the dissolving of the particles of uh, condensed water in the form of dew get back to the air so if you walk, for, for instance, uh, just uh, in, in, in Nosibe, which was uh, your, your case a uh, couple of weeks ago only, you know, if you go out at early evening, you will see dew almost uh, everywhere at, at maybe seven to eight, eight uh, in, in, in the evening, you know, just uh, one and a half hour after the sunshine, uh, after the, the sunset, you can, you can see. It. And if you go at uh, nine in the morning, there's none anymore. Why? Because it gets back to the same to, to, to the same air like like before. So it happens there and back and there and back every day, and of course with a different intensity depending on temperature and on uh, water content in the environment, which uh, are defining, for instance, different seasons. So in dry season, it happens a little bit different way than in um, in the rainy season. But even though, you know, uh, from National Geographic, uh, the, the, for sure, the reports uh, about, for instance, the Namibian desert, you know, and also one of the chameleons is living, you know, uh, the, mm -hmm. the desert chameleon, the chameleon, Cameleo Namaquensis, yeah, the devil of the desert, an unbelievable creature, you know, and it lives there in sand dunes on stones, okay, and it gets hydrated by fog, same like the beetles that find the top of the sand dune, you know, and taking the breeze which is which is uh, uh, pushed there from the Atlantic Ocean and exactly at the at the um, at the top of the of the uh, dune the water gets condensed condensated and they can drink it so they drink the water the same way they inhale it the same way and then they eat the, the beetles which are full of water uh, also uh, to you know to balance the water losses from the hot desert to which they are exposed at the daytime you know and let's talk about the difference between wet season and dry season. Okay. And uh, I'll say the motivation, my main motivation for, for this is because, as you know, it's been a project of mine to study the dry season to see how much of, of value that is to our uh, what we replicate in captivity and giving them that dry season without the dangers. So the benefits without the dangers. So we have to understand the dry season. And this fo uh, fog coming in and the humidity sounds like the way to be safe uh, uh, so they don't dehydrate. But anyway, what is it that you observe during the dry season? Okay. Look, uh, uh, the, the very strange observation that I made then actually, uh, and... Uh, it was more an observation uh, that that came out of a lab, and came out of uh, of the critical uh, comparison of different chameleon environments uh, across uh, Africa. That 
<laughs> and it, it will it, it will sound strange because we know how diverse the chameleons are, yeah. How uh, how huge the span of the biotopes is from the sea level to four thousand five hundred meters height. It's like fifteen thousand feet of Shubot Mount Kenya, yeah. From mm -hmm. deserts like the desert chameleon, yeah. Through uh, swamps like uh, Africanus in Chad, for instance, yeah, uh, to the mountain meadows or or uh, mountain forests and so on, so huge range of of, uh, of environments and also of climates, yeah, because the climate in in the uh, Mediterranean Sea uh, region is almost equal to what we see in the southern tip of Africa, you know, where the chameleons uh, can survive even little a little frost or uh, high in the mountains, they also can survive that and so so huge huge area which they inhabit and then so many biotopes and uh, in one aspect in one aspect the chameleons are actually confined to biotopes which are surprisingly same and what is it it is that approximately more than nine months in a year the biotopes are typical by having fog at night Okay, so regardless, regardless that you have like this Atlantic coast and, and, and the desert chameleon, you know, more than nine months in the year, the fog actually aggregates there and they live there. If, if it is less, they, you, they do not live there. So this is why if you look at the map of, of Africa and you, have, uh, you, have, you see the huge central part, which is full of savanna, savanna is so dry that even in the uh, that, that uh, uh, like in the um, short period of uh, uh, rainy season, the chameleons could survive there, but it is not enough for them to fulfill their usually yearly cycle. So they do not reproduce. When they do not reproduce, they cannot live there for long. Okay, so the very dry environments, which are eight months with fog and less. Uh, have not enough potential to keep chameleons, while all the others have fog actually nine months plus. Regardless, okay. it looks like a desert uh, uh, in, in the desert uh, in the deserts of uh, Kalahari, for instance, in in, in southern Africa. Yeah? Uh, there are uh, of course uh, humid areas. Why? Because the tiny amount of water that the the, the, this, uh, the content of the air there drops down to 5 degrees centigrade. It means like 45 degrees Fahrenheit, you know. And this is when the dew point actually happens there. You know, so in very tiny amount of water gets, thanks to the environment, to the dew point. And dew point means fog, and fog, fog means means dew. And this means night hydration, hydration of chemins. They can survive. If this does not happen, they, they, they do not live there. And wherever you go to, to uh, the places where chameleons live nowadays, be it their natural environments or be it the secondary environments like, for instance, in the U.S. Yeah, I remember with, uh, uh, with uh, big love in my, in my heart uh, our, our um, adventure in, in Florida, you know, when we walked yep, yep. through the environment. You remember that, that we actually observed how the environment actually gets moist at night, you know, and we collected the first animal. It was moist because of water, because of, of uh, 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 condensed water, you know. So they survive in Florida? Of course they do, because the same environmental uh, uh, f f combination of factors happens there, same as it happens in the Hawaii for the, for the three-horned chameleons, same as it happens in some enclaves in, in California where you live, and, and we can see some small uh, chameleon populations there, uh, of course not uh, in their natural habitat, but in the secondary habitat after they have been released, uh, either intentionally or, or by, by, by some accident. So, so it happens, uh, uh, and the proof is actually in these environments as well that uh, the chameleons uh, escape even in, in, in other parts of the world, yeah? but they cannot make it. They cannot make it only there where the humidity levels are so high that the majority of the months in the year, fog is a, a regular part of the, of the nighttime uh, happening.
So what's going on during those, you say, nine months out of the year there's fog? What about the other three months? And, and we know in Madagascar, the, during the dry season, it's so harsh that some species just die. And yeah, they're, exactly. they're represented yeah. in the ground in eggs. So where, is there no water there? This is, is no and this is it. You name it. You just named it. You know, if if the environment is so is extremely harsh, yeah, they die. But they have a special strategy, and we know it about the Yemen chameleon, and we know it about Labordi, and we, we know it about several other species. Uh, that is exactly as you say. The environment is so harsh that there is no fog for three months, and they die. But the moisture is enough to keep the the eggs in the soil uh, moist enough or lose uh, lose some of the, uh, the, the the content before the next uh, rainy season comes and then they suck in the, the, the water again and hatch and they have their uh, seven to eight months to go before the harsh dry season comes which kills almost every single adult specimen there are also uh, other strategies uh, for instance the the flapneck chameleon in central africa uh, in some populations the some specimen can survive they dig themselves in holes or hide themselves under stones what does it mean? They hide themselves from the harsh environment and get to something, to some environment which is cooler. Yeah, Cooler means higher humidity. Higher humidity means less desiccation. Sometimes they can make it. By the way, there are some observations which make me to believe that the same is actually happening, if not everywhere, that some populations of the Yemen chameleon in Yemen as well. They go down in the harsh winter time, which is actually the, the big dry season in Yemen, and they dig themselves in the soil so that a little part of the population can survive. The trouble is that uh, in some area, some um, uh, situations and some areas, we cannot reconstruct the real natural conditions because through human activities, which in this part of the world are from the biblical times uh, very very active uh, the environments were so heavily um, like changed that we do not know its original state yeah but where it seems to be close to it you know the uh, harsh dry season is very harsh but some of the animals can can survive while the, the majority uh, does not so this is this is how it works um, look there is there's one more aspect that we we might take into consideration if you consider if you consider the, uh, the influence of uh, humidity and fog on the chameleon bodies which is how they actually uh, uh, how they balance the, the the water content inside and outside of the body, yeah? Because of course, if you if you look at the chameleon body, so it is like uh, like a small sack of liquid stuff inside, which is protected against the harsh natural environments outside by their special skin. The special skin is not only capable of, of uh, uh, spectacular changes of colors and so on, yeah, and have uh, have uh, structures and, and, and content, which is uh, this has been only a couple of years uh, actually um, uh, explained how, how it works, that, uh, that they uh, actually change color. But this skin, specifically uh, epidermis, is... Uh, uh, shaped in a way that it is actually a membrane which cannot get water through it. So it is a almost perfect water isolant. Yeah. So what does it mean? We have uh, a chameleon body which equals almost like a, you know, <laughs> like let me show you <laughs> a bottle of water. The, bot the water is inside, and all the all the uh, surface is impenetrable of water. You can squeeze it as you want. You, you can spit on it. You can so the water stays inside, you know, and it does not get inside from outside. Other way than through possible three openings. One is cloaca, 
And we know it does not happen in chameleons, you know. In, in some other reptiles, it can quite quite nicely happen, you know. In dracenas, in some anoles, in some in some iguanas, yeah, it is a well known area which is then also used for for hydration even in captivity. Yeah, they give baths to their um, you know iguana and then it, it, it gains water uh, just through exposing their um, butt to uh, to the to the bus. It does not happen in chameleons. Uh, you, re- you remember how how firm and tiny their butt opening is, you know, the, the cloacal opening. This is a fissure which is which is closed if the animal is is uh, is uh, healthy, right? So at the other end of the of the intestinal tract, there are two options. One option is the intestinal tract, which is capable then of, uh, of course, um, uh, um, like getting in the liquid part of the water, and of course the nasal cavities. Uh, with the oral cavity, which uh, uh, combine then in the uh, in the lungs uh, and in the uh, in the pulmonary sacs, building the next gate for potential water. There's nothing nothing more, you know. So uh, the water gets in here, you know, and gets out also here and here. Of course, if they poop, you know, they give out water and. This is then also fantastic for us if, if, if you understand this, yeah. So that the water balance is actually, you know, the trade-off between the intake, yeah, and the expelling of the water, and the homeostasis. It means the stability of the internal uh, uh, environment is then very clearly and very nicely uh, uh, diagnosable by the. Uh, excrements, specifically okay. by poop and its color, structure, and so on, and the urates, which is the uh, typical form of urine for all uh, lower vertebrates, including including chameleons. We can, based on this, very clearly say whether the chameleons is well hydrated or not well hydrated, because the uh, the ultimate task of the chameleon body uh, to survive in the harsh environment to, and to prevent the water losses in case of low humidity periods and months in the year is to to save as much water as possible. Yeah? So they also, you know, uh, get out of the poop and out of the of the urates as much water as possible to get to feed it back to the vessels and feed back feed it back uh, to the blood to to keep all the uh, internal uh, organs uh, uh, in the in the homeostasis state, which is the balanced, well uh, balanced um, physiological state in which the animal uh, feels like well and comfortable. All right, is there anything more that we should talk about the natural condition before we uh, go into replicating it in captivity? There is maybe like the last sentence, because I know that you will ask me that. <laughs> so let us start with it, let's build the bridge, you know, because right. then you say, okay, Peter, okay, now we come to fogging, right? Okay, now... Uh, tell me, uh, w- is there any difference between the fog in the wild and in the fog which we can provide in our using our foggers in the? Oh yes, there. Are the- <laughs> yes. As, uh, uh, was it one of the questions, right? And oh, I have yeah. to say, I have to say yes and no. Yeah, yes and no. And what I say is, yes, there is a difference. I will explain what the difference is. But in fact, the result is technically the same. Okay, so in the wild, again, the uh, uh, the fog is uh, created by Mother Nature in decreasing the temperature. Uh, raising the uh, humidity, the relative humidity to a level of 100% when the air cannot hold the water uh, anymore and has to expel it. First as a fork and second as dew. Okay, so this is how it happens in the wild. This is uh, like uh, very hard to simulate in the uh, captivity. So what uh, the foggers do is they take liquid water, uh, 
and using uh, different strategies of uh, uh, be it piezoelectric crystal uh, vibrating or uh, other other methods you know or spraying you know they make the little particles of the water by mechanical destruction of the of the of the drops of of the of the liquid water okay so the the uh, the way how we get the fog is different this is the physical one and this is the like piezoelectric artificial one the good message for you is that you cannot anyway hold uh, a fog in in your environment uh, at at uh, 75 plus degrees it gets immediately dissolved in the air mm -hmm. you know so it happens only at relatively low temperatures and um, my approximate recommendation is that so that the water content is not too big it should happen below 70 degrees better around 65 yeah then the the danger of being uh, the, the the air being too moist and cause a respiratory disease is zero okay if it is above 70 there is a sp certain zone where it can be harmful and i strictly don't recommend it just for the sake of, of safety okay and uh, uh, the, the good the good news is that the particles we get yeah are equal they are same. Uh, the, the, they can be measured. Their size is uh, equal. It means fog is also not formed by, by particles which are equal. Yeah? There is a range of them. And then when, once they get too big and, and fall too quickly down, we call it mist, but it's, it's, it's the same range. And the same range of the little particles we get through the foggers. And it is actually... Uh, not and it's also a good good news actually it is not so important what kind of focus you have once you get fog it is fine why okay. because it is simply defined by the natural features of the water as chemical or physical substance yeah, to form this tiny little droplets and then once it cannot be uh, formed it, 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 it's it's not fog anymore yeah so there is the bridge where where we, we were able, of course, to, to replicate it in a way, despite of the fact we use different method, we use it at equal temperatures and we get equal exposure to uh, the, the natural environment. All right, so we are going to cut it there. So we talked about what happened in the natural condition that inspired Peter to believe that fogging was not only a hydration technique, but possible to be the main hydration technique. Could early morning fogging in conjunction with the moisture they get from feeder insects be all the hydration that a chameleon needs? That would answer a number of questions that I have about the chameleon's natural condition. But whenever there's a new technique, we are all within our rights to ask for evidence. Does this work? It is a healthy thing. We shouldn't be discarding new ideas, but by the same token, we shouldn't accept new ideas just because they're new. And so I invite you to come back to the second half of this interview, where Peter and I talk about implementing fogging within the captive environment. This is Bill Strand signing off, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>